Hey, welcome back to the Gale Athletics Connections podcast. This has been this has been a guest that I've been I've been teasing on social media. Uh, my man is busy. I get I have no excuses. I'm not busy, uh, but we have finally linked up, and I'm so excited. Please help me welcome Nigel Talton. Nigel, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing really good. You're, you're giving away the punchline. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can see, I'm not going to mention it out loud because you're listening. You're just going to have to wait till we get in. But on this background here on his YouTube, he's already given away his, uh, his part-time job, if you will. And we're going to explore that. Uh, but he's, he's given away the, the prize right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel, so tell me what's you as I've researched some of your bio and we've talked a couple of times through Twitter, uh, which by the way, I gotta we, I need to plug out your Twitter right now because you are really responsive and really active on Twitter. And I and I'm a huge social media fan, so I really like that. How how do people get you on Twitter? It's it's just your name, I think. Is that correct? Uh-huh. No stress Talton. N- that's it. No stress Talton. So T-A-L-T-O-N. Uh, why did you, that's interesting. Why did you pick no stress Talton? <laughs> um, it was back at shorter when I first made my Twitter and I was just like, my teammates like, you need to make a Twitter. I was like, I don't get on Twitter. What would I say? And they was like, man, just say anything, whatever come to your mind. I said, all right. And then they was like, uh, what you going to name me? Um, I was like, I don't know. So uh, we was at a track meet and then, it just came across like no stress talk. <laughs> hey, I, I could use less stress in my life. So I, I like, I might just tr- change mine to no stress Cunningham or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so go, if you're on Twitter, go follow my man at no stress Talton. I, I just, I love your veracity on Twitter. You're always retweeting really cool things. Your posts are really on point and you're, you're really responsive. That's how you and I have communicated think almost exclusively maybe we've had an email yeah a couple of emails but it's been through twitter and i just uh, i just always have to give props when people do social media the correct way you actually respond and things i I just (laughs) love that uh so you are a post-collegiate uh sprinter you're working towards qualifying for the olympic trials and then the you know the big dance here the olympics Uh, i would love to learn more about that and how you got there not many people even get a chance to say they're thinking about trying out for the trials and for the Olympics. So maybe let's hop back. Let's go back to high school. Talk to us. Uh, where'd you grow up? What was high, what high school did you go to? And how did uh, track play a part of your life? Uh, I'm from Fort Valley, Georgia, Central Georgia. Um, some people don't know where's Fort Valley, but if you heard of Macon, Georgia, mm-hmm. uh, we're like 15, 20 minutes from Macon, Georgia. Uh, I went to Peach County High School. I didn't start running track until my junior my junior year in high school, and I didn't take it serious then. I was playing football and baseball. My freshman year, I didn't run because I was hurt. Uh, I broke my femur bone. From right football? Femur. Yep, from oh. football. So I couldn't run track my <laughs> freshman year. And then <laughs> my sophomore year, I broke my collarbone. So From I football? didn't run track. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, football was trying to tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't run track my uh, sophomore year. And then I came back out my junior year. Um, I was running the 100, 200, 4 by one 4 by 4 um, I hated the 4 by 4 <laughs> Spoken like a true 100-meter guy right there. <laughs> yeah, a true 100-meter guy. Like, I don't like doing nothing nothing over 200 meter. I don't know, like, I don't know. Like, I don't like getting tired. <laughs> that area that you grew up in is gorgeous. Uh, when I coached, so I'm from Alabama originally, uh, across, the, you know, where Columbus, Georgia is. Yep. So right across is uh, Eufaula, Alabama, and that's mm-hmm. where I grew up and uh, went to school and coached at Troy University. We used to go to Fort Valley State for track meets back right. in the day. Uh, just love that area. It's some of the greatest just people and just everything. That's just a great area. It's, it's traditional Georgia town in, in my mind. So, that, so <laughs> yeah. you grew up there the whole time or moved uh, into there? Yeah, I grew up there the whole time. Yeah, I love awesome. it. That's good, man. I love that. So when you uh, – were you always trying to do track and football kept breaking your bones, or you, you talked about baseball as well, which is kind of same season? Um, No, I always wanted to play – I always played football. Uh, my mom tried to get me to run track. My – um, when I was younger, I can't remember the age, but I was real young. But I cried because I didn't want to – I didn't like getting tired, so I cried. 
I kept crying, and my mom just finally took me out of recreation track. And after that, I, I to this day I wish I still I didn't cry. I ran track. I wish I was still into it when my when I first got introduced to it. But. Dude, that is hilarious. I, you know, <laughs> maybe I need to remind you. You know, we're recording this, right? You just admitted to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that track made you cry. I, I bet you look back now, there's been some workouts that have made you cry coming through, oh, yeah. the, through the different ranks, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, when you first started, you, you actually were healed. There were no bones broken your junior year, and you started, actually got to participate in track, and we're doing the, the short sprints and the relays. Um, were you any good right off the bat, or how, how, did, that, how did your introduction start? So my junior year, I had the fastest time in the 200 in my region, mm. and we had the fastest time in the region on the on the relay team. So we was picked to go to state. Um, we didn't make it to state in the four by one. Um, our relay guy he ran out this shame zone, and I didn't make it to state in the 200 because I didn't take track series. I wasn't going to practice. I was missing mm -hmm. practice. I was um, just missing practice. I didn't mm -hmm. take it serious. That's interesting, yeah. And, boy, you know, to make it to state in Georgia, that, that's pretty tough. We've had some yeah. Georgia guys that are now coaches on the show before, and, uh, you know, there's just some legacy schools, you know, specifically the Atlanta suburban area, of course, you know, the different uh, McKee trends and Southwest McKee DeKalb trend. and stuff, man. Holy cow. So you make it to state in Georgia, man. Whew, that, that's pretty, pretty stinking good. Pretty good. So, you didn't take it seriously. You missed a lot of practices. Um, what, looking back now, you know, you've got the experience of, you know, you're a, you're a grown man now. You've got experiences in life. And you look back at your junior year self. What was it about track that you just, what, that gave a secondary to you from everything else? Uh, I just wanted to focus on football and then being a high school, high school, I just wanted to be with my friends. Mm -hmm. yeah, m most of us can relate. If, if we're honest with ourselves, we can we can relate to that and say, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So going into your senior year, you, you played football, I assume. Mm -hmm. And when you got the track season, did you take it more serious because it was your last year, or kind of the same? It was just uh, an activity you did whenever you whenever you felt like it. <laughs> I kind of took it serious, but I was playing baseball, and I was not coming to practice. I was going to baseball practice to mm -hmm. learn the signs to be uh, – I was a pinch runner in the play outfield, so I was just going to baseball practice to learn the signs. So we got a new coach. Uh, his name was Coach Turner. He was the girls coach and the guys coach that year, but he mainly been the girls coach all his high – I mean, all his career of coaching into my senior year. And he was like, well, you're going to have to choose between baseball or track. Uh oh so I said, all right, I'm going uh, I'm to stick to baseball. And he said, no, nah, I'll see you at practice at Monday at 3.30. And I, <laughs> I was like. Wait, 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 wait. He said, you've got to make a choice, baseball yeah. or track. You made your choice. And he said, nah, man, I'll see you at practice on Monday. <laughs> yeah, he said, I'll see you at practice on Monday. <laughs> And what he was, was really like, saying was like, look, man, it's my choice, and so you need to be in practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> hey, you know what, coaches, we got to do what we got to do. Sometimes we see talent, and we just can't let it escape to another sport, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Well, how did senior year go? Uh, I assume you kept running the hundreds and 200s. You didn't move up to the 400 or anything. Oh, no. I was still doing the relays. Uh, I made it to state in the hundred. Uh, I made it to the finals. I got eighth. Uh, oh, yeah. I was having hamstring problems. So I made it to state that year. Um, over the summer, I was I was getting offers for football from junior colleges and stuff. And Iowa Wesleyan University, well, Iowa Wesleyan College, but now Iowa Wesleyan mm. University now. Um, a coach was from Macon, Georgia, and he knew of me and stuff. So they offered me a football scholarship, and then they didn't know about me running track, and they offered me a track scholarship as well. Oh, wow. So Iowa Wesleyan, okay, that, that's in the middle of the country. 
you're in, you know, for me, God's country, because I'm an Alabama boy. So Alabama, Georgia, you know, you're all the way down here in the Southeast. Uh, any concerns moving to the middle of the cornfield? Yeah, I was homesick. <laughs> how, how did you go visit before you went for school or was it you just showed up fall for ready for school? I just showed up fall ready for school. Wow, man. Had you ever been to Iowa or anywhere away from home? I've never been to Iowa. Never been to Iowa. <laughs> what were you what were you expecting and then what was reality? What was I was expecting? Um kind of like the same weather as Georgia. And then one day I woke up, it was snowing. So you know, if you have snow days in Georgia, they cancel class. Cancel Everything. School. Yes. <laughs> so I'm I'm asking um I'm asking my my peers and my teammates, I like, we still got to go to class. It's snowing outside. It was like, yes. <laughs> Where are you from again? I said, good. <laughs> that is so funny. Oh my goodness. I, I, I remember I, before uh, my high school years, I grew up in Florida and I remember there being just, just snow. I mean, like there was like a snowflake every five minutes. And I remember we got out of class as an elementary class. We got out of class to go see the snow. Uh, and then, you know, after high school, I moved to Chicago, which means I got, you know, all the snow in the world. It, it is a whole different world. What were you thinking when you saw, you had never seen that much snow before, right? I mean, yeah. Georgia gets frost, essentially, frost. where you're where you're at. They don't get snow. I was like, I didn't go to class that night, to be honest. Did you go? Did you go make like your first snowman or anything like that? Or you were like, no. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want to have anything to do with snow. <laughs> <laughs> Too cold. <laughs> so how did that? Um, did you did you go the whole first year there at Iowa Wesleyan? Yeah, I went the whole first year. I transferred my sophomore year, the second semester, to Shorter University. Okay. Well, stay at Iowa Wesleyan for me. So how did it go playing football and running track there? Did you improve a lot? Did you, um, did you just stop doing football? And I mean, cause you know, spoiler alert, we know you, you, you're a big track guy now, not a football guy. How did, how did that go playing both sports? Uh, it went well. Um, I didn't do spring football. I was on the track team. Um, I brought their 22, 23 year old record in the hundred. I oh, ran wow. a team. I ran ten five four. Um, the number, I'm the number two guy on the all time list for the two hundred meter dash. So it went, wow. it went really good. And that's when I took track, started taking track serious. So th that's interesting. You said that that's when you started taking track serious. So did it, did that seriousness switch start because you started breaking records, or because you started running, say, in the ten six ten seven range before? Obviously, you went to ten five. Um, it got serious because I just seen, I seen something in myself. Um, my senior year in high school, I saw something in myself as well. But then, and I was like, if, maybe if I get the right coaching or whatever other people are um, doing. So kind of that like self, you said the self-realization, but like that, um, that self-worth of like, oh, like, like I, I can actually be good at this. Like, like not just good, like I could actually be better than most at this. Yep, that's what stuck out to me. That's interesting. I've had a, several conversations with, you know, big time guys, you know. Um, one of the last ones I can remember that we talked about this subject was Willie Banks. Uh, Willie Banks, uh, former world record holder in the triple mm -hmm. jump. And we talked about ribbons when you're a kid. And, you know, we, we now as adults, we, we lambast kids about, you know, the everybody gets a trophy, everybody gets a ribbon, that's not healthy. But I've had several conversations, including with, with Mr. Banks there, that when he got ribbons as a kid, that helped him realize that, that self-realization that you're talking about here, uh, the self-worth of like, oh, wow, like, like I'm good at something like this. You know, people are giving me something, whether it's attention whether it's ribbons, trophies, whatever. So it's, that's what I was wondering for you, if it was breaking records. So that's an, that's a, that's a ribbon. Uh, it's a great ribbon. You know, don't, I'm not trying to belittle it, but you know, it's, it's something that you're given like, Oh, I earned that. I broke a record that my name is now on the board. Uh, that helps with your self-worth and you start seeing that, Oh, like I, I can, like I can be recognized for stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I made it to junior national. So 
when I went to Junior National, that's when I was like, yeah. Where was that at? It was in um, Des Moines, Iowa at um, oh, yeah. Drake, Drake yeah, yeah. Great, University. Great place. I love Drake. One of my all-time favorite places. How did that uh, meet go? Because there you go. You're getting the best of the best yeah. uh, of the 19 and under, right? Yeah, 19 and under. I made it to the semifinals. Yeah. It was, I think it was yeah, semifinals. Um, it was some it was some top guys. Like the ones that are still running now is uh that's when I first seen Marvin Bracey. Oh, yeah. Charles Charles Simon, he went to TCU. He was on a relay team. Um who else? Um it was a it was a few stars yeah. out there, stars now, but continue to be stars as right. well. Right. And, so and was this in the hundred that you were did you yeah, right, it was you the run? Hundred. Yeah, Just you didn't run the you didn't run the two hundred. No, I didn't qualify in the two hundred. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. So you did two years at Iowa, and what were you studying? Sports, man. Sport. At first, it was sports therapy, physical therapy, and oh. then when I got the shorter, I changed to sports management because they didn't have uh, physical therapy. What, did is that something you kind of grew up thinking you wanted to do was physical therapy, or how did? Mm -hmm. it, yeah. I wanted to be an athletic trainer, and then when I went to Kennesaw I mean shorter in Kennesaw I wanted to be I want to be a director of operations or athletic director yeah that's oh that's really good your experience with uh, different schools and settings would help with that as well so that's that's really mm -hmm. cool you, you might have to work somewhere one day where there's snow though so just oh yeah be ready. I'll, be, nope. I'll be good then. okay all <laughs> right just checking just checking <laughs> so you transfer from Iowa Wesleyan back closer to home so you go to shorter university mm -hmm. yeah, and how, Rome, Georgia. yeah and how, how was that it was good um i was a six seven time all-american at shorter um we won nationals indoor outdoor outdoor as a team um, I placed second in the hundred meter dash at nationals. Well, uh, yeah, it went well. Holy cow! Yeah, it went well. It was. I got a lot of accolades at shorter. So. Yeah. So, <laughs> what was the difference? So, tell me, what what uh, division does Iowa Wesleyan compete in? Is that NAIA? Yeah, they they were NAIA when I was there. Got it. That's what I thought back and, then. And then and shorter. shorter NAIA. I saw them at nationals when I went to nationals. My freshman year with Iowa, I went to national on the um, in the hundred and in the relay team. Gotcha. And I just saw a shorter there, and I was like, my teammates like, why you didn't go to that school? And I was like, what school? They was like shorter. It was like, isn't Georgia? I was like, I don't know where part of Georgia is. And <laughs> Interesting. So you didn't even know about it coming through high school. No, I never heard of shorter when I came through high school. You grew up in Georgia, so I gotta ask: Are you were you, did you grew up a Georgia fan or a Georgia Tech fan? That's yeah. You know, I grew up in Alabama, so they always ask me Alabama <laughs> Auburn. So w which one was it for you? Uh, I don't want to, I don't want I don't want the Georgia fans or Georgia Tech fans to hate me. I like both of them, but I'm a I'm a Florida State fan. I grew up a Florida State fan. Get out of here. Yeah, I love Florida State. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I, you know, I'm older than you, so I was a fan back when Peter Tom Willis was the um, quarterback and Dexter was the uh, running back, uh, Charlie Ward. You, Charlie do you remember? Ward. Okay, I don't know if you would remember who yeah, Charlie, Charlie Ward was. Ward. So, yeah, this has nothing. No, no one's going to be interested in the story, but maybe you. Uh, so, grew up a huge Florida State fan. Charlie Ward, come on, man, right? He's awesome. I'm in <laughs> Indianapolis one year. I think about 13, 12, 12, 13 years ago for a uh, track clinic, the Indiana high school track clinic. Mm -hmm. so we get, we get done with the clinic for that night. It's, you know, it's late. It's like 10 30, 11 o'clock at night. We hadn't eaten all day. So we're just trying to find some place that's open to, to, to grab something to eat. You know, it was just I was starving. So me and some of the crew and some of the coaches, we went to, um, I think it was steak and shake was the only thing that was open. And so we go in there and I, I guess, the Knicks were playing the Pacers that night and the Knicks walked in and Charlie Ward walked in. He was playing for the Knicks. And mm -hmm. so I was like, I was like, Oh my God, that's like my, like that was my hero growing up. I was like, Oh man, I don't want to bother him. You know, he's, he's you know, he's coming to get, he, he hadn't had his food yet. So I, I felt kind of okay. But I was like, I've got to shake his hand. I've got to be able to one day 
tell Nigel that I shook Charlie Ward's hand. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> So I just go over and I was like, hey, Charlie Ward, or I, I probably said Mr. Ward. I, mean, I was a 30 year old man. I was like, Mr. Ward. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. I was like, I don't want to bother you. I, I know you're, you're busy. You're with your team. I, I just want to shake your hand. <laughs> he shook my hand. I was like, cool. That's all I want. I'm sure there were other Knicks that were like way more famous, but, but I don't like, I don't watch basketball, but I knew Charlie Ward. I didn't care about any of those other dudes. Anybody just, is it, so. that's, that's it. That's it. That's it. Uh, okay. <laughs> hey, this ain't about me. Let's get back. So <laughs> Uh, you grew up a Florida State fan. I have a lot of respect for that. I love that. Um, where were we, Nigel? I've totally lost because now I'm thinking nothing but Charlie Ward. <laughs> <laughs> shorter. You go to Shorter. Sure. You win a whole heck of a lot of team titles. You win a whole lot. You earn a whole lot of All-American honors. Did you um, – were you focused more on the – were you doing both still at that point because it's college? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh I was doing both, but when I first got there, uh, shorter, I got there. The first, I got there the first semester. No, it was I got there the second semester, but I got there in December. Mm. So during indoor season, I was running the four hundred and four by four just to get in shape. Like, and you know me. Well, now you know that. I was about I hate, to say, how did that I go? Running did, that. Did you just a little bit second guess? Like, why did I transfer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow. <laughs> but no, nah, it, it, I felt like that 400 and the, doing those 404 by fours indoor got me ready for outdoor. Yeah. Uh, I did a couple of 60s, but not many 60s, but mm-hmm. I was running the 400 four by four. Like, I was an All American in the four by four indoor. Yeah. Oh, good. So you contributed to the team right off the bat. That's that's yeah. a big step. Yeah. A good team, mm-hmm. obviously. I mean, it takes a heck of a team to win a, a national title or, title or even to be in the hunt for it. So that's awesome. Yes, sir. It was like that when I first got there, Bird was getting me in shape. Mm-hmm. That's, that's Scott Bird's MO. <laughs> <laughs> Get him in shape. <laughs> Now, did you when you transferred to sh- to shorter? Were you still planning on playing football, or was it strictly track? Now at that point, um, I wanted to play football, but um, Bird wasn't going to let that happen. So I was like, Bird is giving me shorter, and Coach Bird is giving me money to mm-hmm. come run track, and I'm closer to home. So I I take that. How did that feel? I mean, football was a big part of your life. Uh, it was. I was like, mm, maybe I should stay, maybe I shouldn't, but I don't know. I kept my faith in just trusting in God, so I feel like God stirred me in the right direction. Yeah, well, you know what? I would agree. That's awesome. I like that you focused on one and, and then had success with it. That way you can't look back and have regrets. You know, if you, if you yeah. stick with track and you didn't do all that great, you'd start thinking, well, man, maybe I should have played football. Uh, so I'm glad that, you know, the silver lining is that you had success with it. Yes, yeah, sir. And you said you changed your major to sports management when you got mm-hmm. to Shorter. Okay. Yeah. And how long were you there? Two seasons at Shorter? Um, two. It was three. Because I, tra- I transferred to Kennesaw my last season. Okay. And I had, I had to sit out that year. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what led to transferring to Kennesaw? Um, the sport. The sports management program, they both, Shorter and Kennesaw, they both have a great program. I'm not going to down talk any program. I just, I wanted to go to a different level of co- competing level, even though at Shorter we competed against the D1s, the D2s, D3s, or whomever. Like, it, it I just wanted to go to a Division One school, and then now I realize, like, it doesn't matter – it doesn't matter what school you go to. Right. If you're good, they'll find you anywhere. Right. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, you know, it seems like we have uh, a very D1 or bust type of mentality for high school athletics. And, I, and I'm yeah. not talking about just the athletes. I'm talking about sometimes the parents, right? The parents, uh, yeah. Or even the coaches who say, you know, well, I'm D1. If you don't go D1, you're no good. And it's like, man, I, I tell people, I always use D3 as my reference, you know, when they talk about, where the best coaches are and there's amazing coaches in every level but you know i always tell people go look at the d3 national championships go look at the the results you know most of those kids were not 
D1 recruitable. You know, they, they just weren't. Some were, but if you go look at what it takes to win and even place, you know, to make All-American in Division Three, those guys and gals had to be coached up like no one's business. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's amazing. And at an NAI level, I mean, again, just go look at nationals. You want to see – what it takes, you think you're, you're only good enough or your only way to success is D1, go look at the rest of the results, uh, junior college included, by the way, and see what it takes. Uh, if you can't win that, then don't think you automatically need to go D1. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, it was cool. So how was your experience at Kennesaw? You go from uh, NAIA, very successful program. You're getting better every year, and you go to Kennesaw, which has, again, a lot of success. I can't remember how many in a row conference championships they had won at that point and continued to win. Uh, Kennesaw, it was it was great. Um, I didn't get to compete. I, uh, well, I did compete, but not under Kennesaw. I had to run unattached because of the transfer rules. But it was it was good. Coach Andy, Coach Morris, those guys, they really got me. Coach Morris really got me together. So I was just training unattached and competing at lo local meets and stuff until the following year. And then you got to compete for Kennesaw the following year? Yeah, I did, but I didn't. The only reason I didn't because I went ahead to be a post-collegiate athlete. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, you know, test the water. So Right. So, you know, when you go from high school to college, regardless, NAIA, again, doesn't matter what level, that's a big leap, right? Like, mm -hmm. not only athletically, you know, um, all the riffraff like me that ran high school, we don't make it to college, so we're all gone. <laughs> uh, so obviously, the athletic talent, your competitors are all much, uh, much higher than what you competed at overall in high school. But also, you're dealing with being on your own, especially what you did going all the way out to Iowa, right? So that's a huge leap uh for everything just mentally physically uh socially there's just a lot of things that are that are changed that you have to step up and learn when you go from college to post-collegiate like i feel like it's 10x harder <laughs> T talk to us about transfer tra not, not transferring the schools but transferring from being okay i'm a collegiate athlete to a post-collegiate, what were some of the things that surprised you that were, you know, hard, uh, maybe not harder, but like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I had to do this. Um, it, it's harder because one, if you're not a sponsor athlete, you gotta, you gotta have a job or if you're getting funds from school, because majority of the time, some post-collegiate athletes, we were still, we were still in school so we could use the track the, um, we could use all the facilities, the therapists and stuff, because we still attend that school. Um, so that's what that was one of the hard parts. But after after graduating from Kennesaw, it just got it just got really hard because you can't use their facilities because you're not a student athlete anymore. So you just got to make sure you have support just have good enough support don't, even though if you don't have support I wouldn't like let it discourage you because if that's your dream I keep pushing it no matter what yeah it's definitely not a dream stopper it's just a uh, it's another you know to use our track analogies another hurdle to overcome right mm -hmm. yeah I, I never uh, the facilities is a pretty tough one I would think um, you know when when you or on a team, obviously you have access to the facilities, but even the ability like to get to a meet. So if you, if there's a meet in Drake, as we talked about, and you needed to get there, well, you know, the coaches and the program take care of it, whether they fly take you out care. there, you drive out there, they do the entries for you, things like that. You now have to do all of that, right? Like if you want to run a meet, you've got to do the entries and get yourself there and all that. Yep. I got to do it. Got to do it myself. And so what about the actual coaching aspect of it? So again, with college, you have a built-in coach. Someone's going to be there to coach you. Uh, how did you pick a post-collegiate coach and who is it and how's that going? Um, so at first, my post-collegiates, I was training with um, Coach Andy at Kennesaw and then Derek Atkins. Yeah. He was at Kennesaw and then now I train with Dwight Phillips. Um, the winter circles group. So it's going, it's going good. We, um, I 
about to start back up for this season um, Monday. Yep, we start Monday for preseason conditioning and getting ready for the indoor season. Do you have like um is it is it like a team in respect like do you guys have a like at three o'clock we're all gonna be there to do the workout or is it more individual? Um some sometimes it's a group and sometimes they're not. So I work overnight, so I kinda go out there with him, uh, with one or two other athletes because of my work schedule. Hmm. And we all know Dwight Phillips an amazing athlete he was. Give us the real. How is he as a coach? He's a good coach. He's a pretty good coach. He, he knows coached. he knows what he's talking about. So he was coached by a few good ones, so I, I assume uh he's he's uh learned from some of the best out there and now transfers it to his athletes. <laughs> yeah. What kind of group do you, how many uh, like in your group is out there? Uh, I think it's to be honest, I think it's 20 plus 20. It might be 20 athletes. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that seems like a lot for a post-collegiate group. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, you, have a, we have a big group. Yeah. Where, where do you guys practice at mostly? Um, we practice at Adams Stadium, Cheney. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody should know about Cheney. It was the one more track for the 1996 Olympics. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like, practicing there is just, I don't know, I get the goosebumps. It made yeah, me feel right? Really <laughs> yeah. And we practice at um, the stadium called Panthersville Stadium. Yeah. Do you have a favorite one? Shaney. Yeah, oh, yeah, because of the goosebumps. and Yeah. yeah. Do, do you, like, just look around and think about, like, oh, man, so-and-so practiced right here. So-and-so warmed up right here. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Johnson was here. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> That's a pretty good one. <laughs> So post-collegiately, we talked about you lose a lot of the ingrained support that you get from college. So not only the coaching, but the facilities, the entry fees, the travel arrangements, things like that. And now that's born on you. So you've got to pay for travel, hotel, uh, therapy, um, shoes. Oh, my goodness, shoes, uniforms, whatever, right? Things like that. Mm-hmm. And somewhere you got to still eat, right? You still got to have food. Uh, so you mentioned a job, an overnight job. So what are you doing to support this uh, this track habit that you have? <laughs> so I work, I'm a shift manager at Amazon. Um, I work overnight. So I work from 5 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. or sometimes 7 a.m. Wow. depends on how long our meeting is at the end of the shift. Um, and I also work for the Atlanta Braves on the grounds crew. So before we get to the grounds crew, um, so you work at one of those Amazon distribution centers. Yes, sir. So I know probably 99% of anybody who's listening to this has used Amazon. So we have you to thank. I mean, it's amazing how quick it gets there. And you know, I've, it's right 99.9% of the time. So you're helping – making sure everybody does their job and gets things loaded up and unloaded and things like that? Yep, making sure all the customers are happy. It's all about the customers. <laughs> you just spouted the Amazon line right there. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> just making sure you guys are happy. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. My, uh, I know I'm happy. My wife, I, literally, I think every day I get a notification that something's coming from Amazon. They have, they have changed the game uh, on what it means to order stuff. Uh, I tell you, it's unbelievable. Um, and it's, it's, it's awesome, honestly, for me as a, you know, as a Amazon customer, and I know others uh, uh, that are listening as well, to actually be able to talk to someone who, who does it. I mean, I, you know, when up till now, you know, to me, it's I pushed a button and, you know, computers delivered everything. I don't know. You know, I see the delivery guy, but that's about it. So to know that, it, you know, it takes a crew and a crew overnight. I, I worked midnights one time in my life for a year. Uh, that is hard on you. Not not just, you know, we'll get to the physical part as, as an athlete that you are, but just mentally, you know, overnight, that's tough. How, how do you deal with that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. I really don't. How, how, how I'm going to assume badly, does it affect you physically? You're You're trying to take your body to run faster than it's ever run and you're I assume on your feet or at least awake overnight. Yeah, it's 
It's hard. Um, last year was my first year training with um, Dwight. So um, I used to, like, during preseason, I used to go to work, same time, get off, get home, take, like, an hour nap, and go to practice during preseason. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was killing me during preseason because preseason is really is when your coach is really killing you to get you in shape, mm-hmm. competition. And then when the season started, indoor started, I was still doing the same thing. And he could tell that I wasn't getting enough sleep. I was running fast in practice, but when I got to the meets, like I was running mediocre times, mm-hmm. slow times. Then I just took some days. I took a week off before indoor nationals, and uh, I did I did decent at indoor nationals. It wasn't my best, but I improved a little bit. So it's yeah, just that's, hard that's, on not getting rest. Well, and it's it's the battle of surviving, paying rent, buying food, all the other things that we talked about, and trying to train at, at the highest of levels. I mean, this isn't – I almost said this isn't ping pong, but I don't want to make any ping pong you – know, there's a professional ping pong player listening right now, Nigel, and I don't want to make that person mad. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the balance there is so hard to, to live and survive and then still push your body to the limits that it needs to to, to run these times that you got to run. Yeah, it's it's hard. <laughs> so on top of that, you said you also work on the grounds crew of the famed Atlanta Braves. You mentioned you played baseball. Did you grow up a huge Braves fan? Oh yeah. Yeah, I of love course, right? <laughs> So what what what's it like? How did you get a job on the grounds crew of the Atlanta Braves? So back at Kennesaw two thousand thirteen, they they came to the school for like a job fair and you know, everybody wants you to apply for their company just to apply. So I, I just be honest, I said, me applying, a thousand people applying, what make you think I get that job? What make you think I'll stand out? Mm-hmm. I never work for, like, I always work for, like, a uh, um, distribution center or, like, McDonald's or any something. Mm-hmm. I was like, how do you know I get the job? They was like, you don't know, just apply. <laughs> so I just applied. I applied, and then after indoor nationals that year in 2013 I got a call from Andrew Worley he was like um I'll be here hiring me to be on the grounds crew um you could come and get your uniform and stuff on this day and we'll start on this day so I've been on the grounds crew ever since 2013. So what does that entail when you say grounds crew is that cutting the grass and doing yeah, I, we, I don't know anything about baseball besides we, grass and dirt that's all I know <laughs> it's not it's not dirt <laughs> it's not dirt what do you mean it's not dirt it's turf <laughs> oh do they turf it there okay i do know some schools are turfing so okay. no it's not turf it's just called surface we call it turf oh <laughs> we don't like we don't like we don't like when people say it's just dirt <laughs> <laughs> hey you probably just saved me from saying that to a baseball player to his face all right turf all right i got it i got it i got it so uh we just put surface down uh we paint the line file lines, we cut mm. the grass, um, we water, we um, reach out the lines, rake, rake the cutout areas around the bases, um, set up for BP practice, take down BP practice. Um, that the big up. Bubba thing, you got to take that up and down? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. the cage, we mm-hmm. take the cage down and stuff. Down. We just make sure the players have a safe, um, safe surface to play on, um, make sure it look good. How meticulous are they with like, you know, making sure everything's smooth and the grass is cut to a specific height? Are they real specific or is it kind of general? Um, they kind of specific. Uh, mm-hmm. We hate when people step on the grass. Uh, we, really? hate so, <laughs> <laughs> we hate that. So yeah, that's how particularly we are. We hate when people step on the grass. That's funny. <laughs> Do you interact with the players much, or is it more just the the crew and and? Uh, uh, it's it's just the crew. Um, I um a lot of the players know me. Um, I speak to them and stuff because at Turner Field, like we park right there at the by the players' lot, so we see the players and they they speak to us like we. We're not going to run up and say, hey, can I have your autograph and stuff? But they speak to us, so we so speak back. you're not going to run up to them like I ran up to Charlie Ward is what you're saying. I got you. I heard you loud <laughs> not, and clear there. Not not doing work. Not doing work. Maybe, <laughs> maybe out in public somewhere. <laughs> 
so you're you're doing an, an excellent job getting the grass to the exact measurement, making sure no one walks on it. I'll make sure I, I, I know that. I'll I'll keep note of that if I ever go to a baseball field. But now you're known, and again, if you're watching, you see in the background here, you're known as the freeze. So if you didn't know Nigel was the freeze, it's, it's amazing how many people know who and what the freeze. I, I told you I'm not a baseball guy at all, and I knew about the freeze. So for someone, for the odd duckling out there right now, Nigel, who has never heard of the freeze, talk us through what the I'm gonna call it a character right the character what does the freeze do and then we'll start talking about well how did it come about and things like that but run us through what does the freeze do for the Atlanta Braves um so the freeze is an in-game entertainment um I give a fan a head start and I just go try to track them now <laughs> on the what do you call the, the warning, warning track on the warning track yeah yeah I knew that warning track see I knew that part <laughs> of baseball so you race people from the, and these and it's legit these are just people from the stands these aren't this isn't set up or anything no, no setup and they get a head start and you rate you guys have a you know a start and a finish line and you race so let's take a step back then how did this even start were you screwing <laughs> around at work one day and you raced one of the guys and somebody saw like oh, how, how does this even become a thing um they knew they knew i ran track and the last season at Turnerfield, it was the one of the last couple of home games. I did the stolen base challenge in my grounds crew uniform. So the stolen base challenge is um, they give a you got to go get a fake base by second base from the right field from the right field five ball. They give you like 20, 20 seconds. They give a fan 20 seconds to get down there and back with the um, base. I did it. Um, I don't know how fast I did it, but it was pretty fast. And they knew I ran track, so they was like, hey, over the summer when the season ended at Turner Field and they was moving to Cobb County, um, someone in the entertainment asked me, hey, do you want to be a part of um, this new promotion we go, we're trying to do? Um, we'll give a fan, you'll give a fan a hit. No, they just say you'll be racing a fan. I didn't know I was going to give a fan a head start until like two days before opening day, they was like, hey, can you come out here? We're going to do some little practicing of you uh, running. I said, okay. But in my head, I was like, I run track. I don't know if I need to come out here and practice. But I was like, all right. I went out there, and then they was like, so this is the deal. We're going to give a fan a head start, and we're going to tell you when to go. So I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, like, a fan a head start doing a a baseball game, what's the odds of me getting beat because it's a baseball game? <laughs> so it's it came out to be me actually giving a fan a head start and someone telling me when to go. So because at first you were when they were like, yeah, we're going to line you up with a fan. You had to be like, oh, easy peasy. Oh, yeah. Like the average said, fan. Come on, man. The and, average fan. I said, it, oh, yeah, I'm in. And where do they do – do they do it, like, during the seventh inning stretch or where do... – uh, It's it's different. Sometimes it's the bottom of the third, the bottom of the sixth. Um, okay. But most fans, I mean, we know baseball. They they sell enough uh, beer and pretzels and <laughs> hot dogs. You're thinking, oh, man. I, they, they could probably pick the best person in the fans, and I'm probably still going to beat them because they're going to be consuming, et cetera, right? And then they tell you, uh, yeah, we're going to give them a head start, which you still had to feel pretty good. But when they started, con they control when you actually go, though. Yeah. yeah that's, where you, that's where it's like, oh, well, wait a minute. How much of a head start? <laughs> <laughs> so how do they determine that? Uh, it's just, I don't know, to be honest. That, it's it's willy-nilly? It's, it's not even like – It's the real deal. It's no WWE. <laughs> it's just someone goes, you know what? This guy, this guy looks like uh, like your host today. He looks a little chubby, so uh, we're gonna give him a big head start. Or they go, "Ooh, this one looks pretty athletic. Don't give him as much of a head start." Because the the goal is not just for you to beat them, right? The goal is like for you to barely beat them, right? Because that's the that, that gets everybody riled up and yada yada yada. Barely, and all like, barely beat them. Wow. <laughs> oh, and hold on. And we're totally dismissing over. I'm gonna have to bust your chops here a little bit. This suit that you have to wear. Yeah, exactly. So you look you look like a popsicle. This this freeze thing, <laughs> head to toe, huge. It looks like uh, ski uh, glasses. Uh, how did 
I assume, let me, let me hope anyway, you did not have input. They just forced the suit on you. <laughs> no, I don't have no input. I came, <laughs> I came, I came into work to the grounds crew and they was like, Naj, you got some stuff in your locker. I said, all right. And it was that. They said, this is for the freeze. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think when you put this thing on? Yeah. Um, the first, the first suit was like a morph suit and then it was like a track suit on yeah. top of the morph suit. So that was easy to get into, but somebody had to zip the morph suit up. And then now <laughs> the one, now I still have to get help getting zipped in. So <laughs> it's funny though. <laughs> how, how did they come up with the name, the freeze? Um, so it's actually... Um, they are a partnership with Racetrack. Mm, okay, yeah, I saw Racetrack, right, okay. So they have a freeze drink at Racetrack stores. That makes sense. That makes so sense. they just came up with, the Braves came up with that idea. And, and how often do you do it every home game? Um, no, it was every, um, the first year it was like every other, like when it went viral, it was like every other game. Um, then last year it was just Fridays and Saturdays. And the, the one that went viral. So if you go Google the freeze, I'm sure this will be the first race that pops up. Uh, this guy gets an amazing head start. Again, it was, I don't know how you could have beat this guy, any guy to be real honest with you, but this guy, this guy pulls up Mike Cunningham. Actually, he gets a little cocky at the, he's getting close to the finish line. He's raising his hands. He thinks he's got the freeze beat and the freeze is trucking it, let me tell you, and pass it as he gets close, and you pass the guy, he tries to, like, speed up, and he falls flat on his face. I mean, I feel for the guy, because I think that's exactly how it would have it looked if I would have done it, and that, that really did go viral. It was on ESPN, e all the ESPN social medias. Uh, it was everywhere. You could, that's why I ask, is it, is it, is it real? Because it, that looked so, you couldn't have painted a better picture. Like, like WWE style here, like you knew the outcome was coming, but that was totally legit. That dude got cocky and fell and legit. everything. That was legit. So when I'm running in my mind, I'm just, I'm just thinking like I'm at a track meet. So I was just running. <laughs> wow. Who, how do they pick the guy? Um, so they just randomly pick people um, during the game or before the game. Do those, so do those guys talk to you? Like, so when you're waiting for the end of the inning or whatever, do they like, hey, so uh, tell me more about you, Freeze. Are you like an Olympian or do they, do they talk to you at um, all? Or? Some, some talk to me now. Um, well, they always speak. Like, we always speak and they always introduce, say, hey, this is Mike from Alabama. So they always, <laughs> they always like introduce them to me. Has anybody been like, uh, like, like stupid cocky, like, dude, you are not going to win this one this time, freeze. Or is everybody kind of like, yeah, we'll see. Some, some be cocky. I, I just, I just laugh. Okay. Then I got to ask, ha have you ever lost? Yeah. I lost before. What happens? Are you not supposed to lose? You're the freeze. <laughs> I can't, I can't win them all. It's they only, it's all about the fans. If I win every, every race, it wouldn't be fair. Yeah, it seems like every time someone would have to fall, but then it would get, it would get old, right? Like, okay, yes. he's winning again. They're going to fall, right, 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 right. Do they, yes. get a, do they get a prize if they beat you? Um, yeah, they get a um, gift card at racetrack and some Braves Panier. Do they get a bigger – Do they get? I assume they get a gift card no matter what. That's how most of these promotions get, go. Do they get a bigger bit gift card if they beat you versus just finishing? <laughs> um, no, I think it's like it no always – price yeah they should they should get a prize if they beat you man they're beating a, a big time guy so they should get they should get extra <laughs> no one's ever gotten hurt have they no nobody got hurt oh good 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 i know if you raced them to oblivion there man <laughs> so <laughs> no, what, got hurt. this is super unique um this job this, this part of your job um i hope they're i won't even ask I'll just, I'll just assume that they are taking care of you for doing extra beyond groundskeeping. We'll just keep it at that. Um, but it's super unique. H how has that, this aspect of being the freeze, has it affected your, 
I don't want to say your personal life, but like, are there other opportunities that are make, making themselves available now because you do this? Like maybe a, a job in the marketing department, you're a smart, sports marketing major or a smart, sports business major. Is there opportunities to be in the marketing and business side of, of baseball? Um, hopefully one day when it's all said and done, when I'm done doing the freeze, hopefully um, I have a something waiting for me. I'm just going to keep pushing, keeping my faith. That's awesome, man. I love hearing that. That's the second time you've referenced that. So, uh, you know, I, I think that that's a huge aspect of success. Uh, it can be anyway. And I, I love hearing that. That's awesome. Well, Nigel, as we wrap up today, um, you didn't get a chance to make the, uh, the Olympic trials this year because of everything that went on. I don't know if you're aware coronavirus happened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that affected you doubly track and your job, right? For the, for baseball. Oh man, it's a double whammy. Um, but you know, we talked about it's expensive, you know, with shoes and gear and all this kind of stuff. Uh, do you have anything set up like uh, GoFundMe or uh, merchandise or anything that maybe if someone wants to support you, they can, they can find you? Yeah, I have a GoFundMe, and I also have a site where I got shirts and things I'm selling for with my motto. Um, my motto is, I can, I am, I will finish the mission. Oh, tell so, me about that. It's a, uh, it's a slogan that me and my mom came up with like a long, long time ago, and I've just been sticking to that slogan. So it's, I can, I am, I, I will. will finish finish the mission finish the mission and the mission is um whatever the end whatever in store whatever god got in store for me so oh that's interesting yeah yeah so it, it it's a it's a motto that can it's not just for track in the sense of like oh, okay i can i will like i am i will finish i will make the olympics it's like i will get this job i will be this type of person i will do this yeah it's it's a life it's a life slogan. It's not yeah. just a yeah. Well, uh, if you look down in the description of today's podcast or on the YouTube, if you're watching, I'll have those links. If you'll send those to me, Nigel, uh, mm -hmm. I'll put those links on there. If you're led to support uh, another one of our great track and field athletes that are, you know, it's going for the gold and he may or may not make it. That's the, that's the great part of it. But you know what? He is working hard and, not, he will not allow regret to come into his life. I can tell from, from talking with you about your faith and your mission, um, success or not, you're not going to look back and regret. You're going to give it all your everything, uh, to oh, make it towards that mission. I just, I just absolutely love that, man. That is so cool. Yeah. I just well, want to inspire the people. Um, I just don't want people to give up on their dream because just because, Oh, I'm a post collegiate. Uh, I don't have the much support. I just I don't want nobody to give up on their dreams. So like it's like doing the freeze kinda like helped me like to continue to push because um kids wanna be like the freeze. Kids was dressing up Halloween <laughs> and freeze Dude. costume. It just it just made me feel it made me feel good that I, I know somebody somebody watching and taking notes. So you Hey, this is a great example. You are making a difference in people's lives, even the ones you don't see. Now, you get to see the ones that maybe dress up like the freeze, but people, they see guys like you, and you become a role model to them. Uh, yeah. that, that is awesome, man. I, I love that. We just want to bless that so much, just your, your attitude there. That, that, that's half the battle is having the attitude to, to go after things and be successful. Uh, the other half is the, sometimes it's the luck and then all the other things that play into it, but you definitely seem to have the work ethic and you definitely seem to have it up here and right here, my man. So I just, uh, I'm so, I'm so happy to be able to have this time with you and get to learn that more and share your story to, to more people. Uh, I think it's just so, so important for people to see that your, your, your thought there about, you know, inspiring people to not give up, what better time that's more needed now than ever <laughs> in normal world that's needed but right now with things getting shut down and no seasons and uh, jobs being lost we need to hear that type of attitude from guys like you more to not give up never ever ever give up keep striving keep driving man so i love it so tell me what it is it's i can i am i will finish the finish finish the mission yes sir 
I love it. We're going to have those links down here in our description. Uh, again, hit him up on Twitter. No stress. I'm starting to get uh, get the feel of this no stress uh, Tom thing. I get it now. You're very laid back, man. I love it. You're out there. People are giving head starts to you, and you're still tracking them down. That's just like life, right? Some people get head starts. You, you, you either quit or you, you, you race them and you see what happens, man. And what a yeah. great analogy for what life is and, and how you're doing it. So thank you so much for uh, being with us here today, Nigel, man. I, this was a lot of fun and well worth the back and forth and uh, missed opportunities that we had. I'm just so, so pumped that we got to do this. No problem. Thank you for inviting me. Huh? Absolutely, man. Thank you.